Hello everyone. Welcome to Digital Communication Tutorials. In this video, I'm going to briefly discuss about pulse amplitude modulation. To start with, let us define what is modulation. Modulation is a process by which the property or a parameter of the high frequency signal, which is usually a carrier, is varied in proportion to the low frequency signal, which is usually the baseband signal. In fact, we use modulation techniques to alter the signals in both time as well as the frequency domain to accomplish desired objectives. When I was discussing sampling in one of my previous videos, we find that it in fact creates a type of pulse modulation called as pulse amplitude modulation. To be very precise, pulse amplitude modulation is a form of signal modulation where the message information is encoded in the amplitude of the series of signal pulses. That is why the name pulse amplitude modulation. In PAM or pulse amplitude modulation, the amplitude of the carrier consisting of a periodic train of rectangular pulses which in fact acts as a carrier, is varied in proportion to the sample values of the message signal, which in fact acts as the baseband signal. In this type of the modulation, it's very, very interesting to note the pulse duration is held constant. However, the pulse may take any real voltage value that is proportional to the value of the original waveform, that is, the modulated signal can have pulse amplitudes that can have any value. No information will be lost in this particular process of pulse amplitude modulation. However, the energy will be redistributed in the frequency domain. In my next slide, I will show the frequency domain plots for the information bearing signal and we will see how the redistribution is done. Coming to pulse amplitude modulation, particularly as an outcome of the sampling, PAM signals can be generated in three different ways. The first one is through ideal sampling. Then we have the natural sampling and finally PAM signals generated through flat top sampling. In this video, I'm going to briefly discuss each of these procedures in the upcoming slides. To start with ideal sampling. Here we have shown waveforms for the input signal, its frequency spectra. Then we have the sample signal and its frequency spectra. The generation of PAM signals by ideal or impulse sampling is achieved by instantaneously sampling the input signal W of t at regular intervals given by Ts. As you can see here, we have the input signal W of t and we are going to instantaneously sample this W of t by taking samples at a duration of 1 Ts. So when I do so, I will be obtaining a waveform that will look like this and this is what is being called as the instantaneous sample waveform, also called as impulse sample waveform. The sample signal so created, as you can see here, will consist of both positive as well as negative pulses. However, it is not always mandatory. If the input signal consists only of positive amplitudes, then the sample signal will also consist of pulses of positive amplitude only. This type of sample generation can also be thought of as multiplying the input signal that is W of t with a Dirac Coombe function. A Dirac Coombe function can also be thought of as a train of unit impulses separated by 1 Ts. Coming to the frequency spectra, you can see this is our frequency spectra of the input signal and once you sample it, we are going to obtain replicas of the original frequency spectra and this in fact we have discussed in our ideal sampling theorem which was discussed in one of my previous videos. I would like you to kindly refer to that video for more information on this. Finally, giving an equation for the sample signal, we will have summation of W of NTS multiplied by delta of T minus NTS. This is the Dirac delta function situated at T equals to NTS. If I take a train of such delta functions, then it will be called as Dirac Coombe function. Right, so that is about the impulse sampling or instantaneous sampling or ideal sampling. Let us move on to the second technique that is PAM signal generation by using natural sampling. So the setup for natural sampling is as shown here. In fact, natural sampling signals are generated by passing the input signal through a switching circuit. Here, as you can see, we have an analog bilateral switch and whenever the switch is closed, the input is passed on to the output and when the switch is open, the output is equals to zero. 
the overall operation of the switch that is the closing and opening of the switch is controlled by the clock signal and this clock signal is Dirac Coombe function which in simple words is a train of impulses. Therefore, PIM by natural sampling is generated by using a pulse train S of t called the sampling signal in order to operate an electronic switch as we have shown in this diagram. This produces samples of the analog signal which will be like this. So you can see we have our input signal W of t. Then we have the control signal also called as the pulse train which controls the switch. Whenever a switch is closed we are going to obtain a rectangular pulse. It is very interesting to note that when the switch is closed the signal is going to appear at the output as it is only for a duration of capital T which in fact is the duration or the width of each rectangular pulse in the control signal waveform that is S of t. So when I say the switch is closed for a duration of each pulse the message signal is allowed to pass through the switch to the output and when we perform this operation at repeated intervals then we are going to obtain a naturally sampled signal which will have the amplitude as that of the input signal. This is the characteristics of natural sampling. To provide an equation we have Ws of t which is our natural sampled signal equals to A Fs into t where A is the amplitude of our pulse train. Then Fs is the sampling frequency. Then we have capital T which is the width of each pulse in the pulse train. Then we have summation sync of Fs and t into W of t which is our input signal multiplied by e to the power of j 2 pi Fs n and t. This in fact was already discussed in one of my previous video by the title natural sampling process. Once again I would like to inform you to kindly refer to that video for more information on how we derived this expression. Further in order to obtain the original signal W of t from the naturally sampled signal we move on to the demodulation process. So what we are going to do here is we have our PAM signal which is the naturally sampled signal represented by Ws of t multiplied with the Dirac Coombe function. We have a Coombe oscillator here you can see we have a Dirac Coombe function. So we are going to multiply our input naturally sampled signal with cos n omega s t and then we are going to pass the output of this multiplier through a low pass filter with bandwidth given by plus w to minus w. Here it is given as fc0 to minus fc0. The output of the low pass filter will only be the frequency contents as we had in our original signal. Now the overall idea why we use this low pass filter comes from the replication of frequencies after sampling. Let us go back to the previous slide. Right. As you can see the overall process of sampling is going to create replicas of the input signal spectrum. Out of these multiple spectra only the original frequencies which lie between B and minus B or W and minus W are of interest to us. So by passing the sampled signal spectra through a low pass frequency having a bandwidth W and minus W or B and minus B we will only be obtaining at the output of the reconstruction filter those frequencies that are in the original signal. All other replica frequencies will be eliminated and that is what will constitute our original signal. Coming back to the demodulation diagram you see we have C W of t which in fact is an estimate of the original signal W of t. Right so that is about natural sampling. Finally we move on to the third technique of generation of PAM signals that is by using flat top sampling process. For flat top sampling we perform an instantaneous sampling of our original signal and then we extend the samples of the instantaneously sampled signal to a width of capital T. However it is very very important to know that when I perform instantaneous sampling I must maintain a minimum width between each sample and that is given by the sampling interval which is usually represented as Ts. So the original signal W of t is instantaneously sampled and then the width of each pulse is extended to one capital T which will be the width of the pulse or we have actually the width of the rectangular pulse to be very precise here. So the flat top sampling produces pulses 
whose amplitudes will remain fixed during the sampling time. This is unlike natural sampling because in natural sampling as we see the sample signal amplitude particularly the pulse amplitude is going to vary very similar to how the input signal varies. This is because the input signal is simply passed to the output over that particular duration. On the other hand, in the flat top sampling, we are going to perform instantaneous sampling of the input signal and then we are extending that corresponding sample to a width of 1 capital T. Therefore, the top of each pulse that is generated after performing flat top sampling will be flat. That is why the name flat top sampling. Further, the amplitude value of the pulse will depend upon the amplitude of the input signal at that corresponding time of instantaneous sampling. However, as we already have discussed flat up sampling in one of my previous videos, we find that this particular technique is going to cause what is called as an aperture effect. Therefore, we are going to require equalizers at the output of the receivers in order to eliminate these effects. So, that is about the generation of PAM signals using the three sampling techniques. Coming to the transmission bandwidth requirement, as per the definition, particularly with respect to the flat top sampling, we would require a very wide band of frequencies to transmit this particular waveform. However, this need not be so if only we were to formulate the pulses in terms of a standard pulse. In simple words, if I represent each pulse by using a standard pulse definition, then the overall bandwidth required will be reduced by multiple amounts. In fact, we have given an equation here to represent the same. What we are going to do is instead of representing H of T indicating a rectangular pulse, we are going to use a standard pulse represented by V of T minus NTS. By using the standard pulse in place of the rectangular pulses as what we have defined in the flat top sampling, the overall transmission bandwidth requirement can be reduced for particularly PAM signals generated by flat top sampling technique. Right. So, yes, that is about the discussion on pulse amplitude modulation. Before I end this video, I would also like to highlight some of the drawbacks of the pulse amplitude modulation technique. First and foremost, as we already have said, bandwidth required for transmission of PAM signals is quite high. However, this can be compensated by replacing the rectangular pulse by a standard pulse. Then, since the amplitude of PAM signals can take any values in the modulated signal, interference of noise for PAM signals is quite high. Lastly, the variation of the peak power required by the transmitter is also one of the drawbacks of the PAM technique. Yes, so with that, I end this discussion on the pulse amplitude modulation. I hope you liked this video. If you did, kindly press that like button and subscribe to my channel for more videos on digital communication. Thank you for watching. Have a good day.